fallout from Donald Trump's comments and alleged behavior toward women is felt here and across the nation. The normally sleepy contest for county supervisor has District 3 residents wide awake. Measure A will raise billions to deal with traffic, but some don't agree with the plan. And we'll take one more look at the measure to allow 1,700 homes on 600 North County acres. I'm Mark Sauer. The KPBS Roundtable starts now. Welcome to our discussion of the week's top stories. I'm Mark Sauer. And joining me at the KPBS Roundtable today are Sarah Libby, Managing Editor of Voice of San Diego. Hi, Sarah. Hey, thanks for having me. Glad you're here today. Reporter Maya Shri Krishnan, also a Voice of San Diego. Hi, Maya. Hi, Mark. Glad you're here today. Metro reporter Andrew Bowen of KPBS News. Hi, Andrew. Hey, Mark. And KPBS North County reporter Allison St. John. Welcome back, Allison. I'm glad to be here, Mark. Good to see you today. Well, a leaked recording of Donald Trump bragging about sexually assaulting women has rocked the already tumultuous presidential campaign. Trump dismissed it as, quote, locker room talk and insisted he never did such things. Here's Anderson Cooper raising the question at the last debate. Are you saying that what you said on that bus 11 years ago, that you did not actually kiss women without consent or grope women without consent? I have great respect for women. Nobody has more respect for women than I do. So for the record, said, you're saying you've never did that? I said things that, frankly, you, you hear these things are said. And I was embarrassed by it, but I have tremendous respect for women. Have you ever and done those women things? women have respect for me. And I will tell you, no, I have not. All right, but since then, several women have come forward saying Trump did indeed kiss and grope them. The fast-moving Trump scandal also prompted tens of thousands of women to reveal their own personal experiences with demeaning sexual conduct. So, Sarah, go back to the recording when it leaked uh, last Friday, a week ago here. I mean, what was your reaction? What was the reaction of women uh, in your life, people you know? I mean, it's a little bit of a mixed bag because we're only just now starting to get this outrage once we heard the tape. But we've actually heard a lot of these allegations before in lawsuits um, from one of Trump's own ex-wives um, and from a lot of different people who have come forward over the years and said these types of things happened to him. And so... I think a lot of women actually weren't shocked when they heard this. Um, you know, they were probably saddened and disgusted, um, but are a little, you know, confused by the fact that we're only so outraged now that we're hearing it from him himself. And of course, as we've said, it's been fast moving, a lot of developments uh, day by day, almost hour by hour um, since that thing happened last week. One of the interesting things, and this was a major story in the, in the New York Times, was uh, about some of the social media reaction uh, uh, in author and uh, social media maven, I guess is the word, Kelly Oxford. Uh, tell us about that. That was right, right. Yeah, so she, yeah, it was. She uh, shared her own story of an experience uh, that she had with some unwanted, you know, touching and groping and, and encouraged other people to share their stories. And I think even she was shocked by just the enormous outpouring, just thousands and thousands of women sharing their stories. Um, and it just piled up and really became kind of like this massive snowball effect of women saying these types of things have happened to me. Right. Is uh, open up to everybody else. Allison, I mean, are you shocked at the, the reaction and some well, of the personal experiences? You know, I think it's interesting. We all thought that having Hillary Clinton in the race would raise women's issues. But it seems like really it's Donald Trump that's the one that's kind of put a, a be a hornet in the hornet's nest, you mm -hmm. know, of women's issues. That's what's really creating a lot more dynamic discussion about how women are being treated mm -hmm. in the workplace, even than, than Hillary Clinton's candidacy. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think that part of the reason why his treatment of women is coming up is because his opponent is a woman. Um, and I do think, at the very least, it's good that now this discussion is at the forefront of a national presidential campaign um, and we're having we're being forced to have a candid discussion about what women actually deal with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it doesn't sure. really seem like we're having the discussion in the right direction. We're not talking about all of the things that we could be doing to make things better for women. We're sort of just getting our minds around how terrible they actually are. Mm -hmm. What um, do you think oh, those Andrew? things are? What could we be doing to make things better for women? Well, I think that Hillary Clinton has been talking about a lot of proposals about, you know, uh, child care in the workplace um, and, and paid leave policies and things like that to sort of um, have that burden shared. Um, that's getting people. drowned out a little bit because of all Absolutely. this Absolutely. And so, you know, you, you 
the difference between those kinds of policies and should a woman be able to take a bus without being groped are, are very different conversations. Well, yesterday, yeah. Thursday, we had two dramatic speeches. One was Donald Trump, as we said, defiantly saying this never happened, it's all made up, it's a lie. And then Michelle Obama, the first lady, of course, speaking on behalf of the Clinton campaign. Here's what she said. This is disgraceful. It is intolerable. And it doesn't matter what party you belong to, Democrat, Republican, Independent, no woman deserves to be treated this way. None of us deserves this kind of abuse. All right, and one of Trump's points in his speech was that uh, these, it's been years ago, these women didn't come forward, and that does, uh, and, and that's quite often the case in these situations, right? Women don't come forward, and, and why was it in some of these specific uh, instances when, when women are asked, why didn't you say this at the time, it's, it's years later? Well, one thing that's important to remember is that when it happens to you, it happens in isolation. And so I think it's easy to say, well, maybe there's something I did that brought this on and you just think it's an isolated incident. And then when it's on a public stage and he's on video himself saying that he does this all the time, it's only then that you start to realize, oh, this happened to a lot of people. And I think him denying that it had ever um, you know, happened in reality on that debate stage, really a lot of these women have said that's what sparked them to come forward. Just having that experience denied publicly by someone who's running for president, I think really was the last straw for a lot of them. Right. Well, I wanted to bring in, as I said at the open, this is affecting races. It's affecting races here in, in San Diego County and across the country because Trump, of course, is at the head of the Republican ticket here. Congressman uh, Duncan Hunter Jr. was on uh, KPBS and, and talking about this. Let's hear what he had to say. Oh, oh, I'm I'm sorry. We don't have a bite here. Well, what he said was he was in the Marine Corps. He's been to war, and and he recorded this stuff. My Marines said they were talking about after not seeing a woman for seven months. Let's just uh, leave it at that. So I find this uh, completely unfair. Well, I don't think that it's kind of an apples to oranges situation here. We're not talking about some Marines sitting there talking around the campfire while they're deployed for a, a long period of time. I mean, we're talking about a man who's running beauty pageants, who's running uh, uh, shows and and, uh, and um, celebrity apprentice and these sorts of, uh, of uh, workplace issues, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, again, there's a difference between whatever you think appropriate locker room talk is and sexual assault. And, um, what he's talking about was, you know, something that's a crime. Um, you know, I think dragging the military into it is a little bit offensive, especially in a town like this. You know, I'm a military wife myself, and I don't, you know, wish to be associated with that type of behavior or justifying those mm -hmm. types of comments. Mm -hmm. But I do think there's a danger in terms of uh, the kind of media that we all choose to watch because it might be easy to think that this kind of behavior automatically disqualifies him as being a presidential candidate in many people's eyes. But if you cho choose to watch uh, perhaps different media, um, it's really important to, to get a broad understanding of what everybody's watching because some media are just spending their whole time attacking Clinton, attacking previous mm -hmm. presidential candidates. So, you know, we, we may think that this um, is a, a, a feeling sweeping the nation among women, but as a Brit who saw what happened with Brexit where David Cameron, you know, bet his career basically on thinking mm -hmm. people would vote logically and the vote did not turn out as he expected. All right, quickly, last question before we leave this topic here. Uh, is there a silver lining to this just because it's creating a national discussion on, on women and workplace issues and, and men in power, uh, Andrew? I, all I was just gonna say is, I mean, th this has happened before in America. Think of the Clarence Thomas confirmation It's happened before here. in San Diego. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, this, 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 is, this is not the end of discussion. It's, it's, you know, maybe we'll make some progress here, but um, it's going to happen, it's gonna continue. Okay, well, we'll certainly watch and maybe watch while we're on the air, more news is breaking on this. Who knows? It's just a very fast-moving story. All right, well, it's usually a cakewalk to re-election for San Diego County supervisors, but not in District 3 this year. Dave Roberts, the board's only Democrat, is in a tough battle with Encinitas Mayor Christian, uh, Kristen Gaspard. Uh, Maya, what's the main vulnerability here for the incumbent, uh, Roberts, the Democrat? Well, Dave Roberts had a scandal in his office the first year, and several staff members left, and the county ended up paying a little over $300,000 to deal with legal issues in relation to that, and I think that that's why he's facing, you know, pretty tight opposition this election. All right, so, so that would explain, of course, why Gaspard really wants to stress uh, ethics, and Roberts would 
really like to put that in the rearview mirror and focus on issues. Yes. <laughs> um, and I mean, he's really been stressing that the DA has chosen not to take criminal charges against him. Um, and I think Gaspar's point is that, well, you know, it shouldn't have even gotten that far anyway. Mm -hmm. so. and, and what about uh, Gaspar? We said she's the mayor of that of that uh, city in Sanitas. So what are some of her uh, weaknesses or he's, the things he's trying to point out? Well, I mean, speaking of, of Trump, I think one of her big weaknesses was that right after the primary, she said that she supported Trump. and. Um, he is a very polarizing figure, and that can really shift people one way or another. And she has since, you know, rescinded that endorsement um, and her favorable opinion of him in public, but I don't think people are quick to forget that. Mm -hmm. uh, and then also in the coastal part of that district, people tend to be a little more slow growth and environmentally friendly, and I think that Gaspar is seen as being really close with developers and possibly a little too development friendly for some people. Right. Like Allison? It's, it's not just being seen, <laughs> is it? I mean, there's evidence that there's hundreds of yeah, thousands of her. dollars yeah. being thrown into her campaign, and on the one hand, you might say she's fortunate to get all this support from independent PACs, but on the other hand, I think this is creating a problem for her because then people do ask, you know, what are all these pro-development interests going to expect from her if she gets elected? Mm -hmm. We do have a uh, clip from, uh, from the candidate, uh, Gaspar. Let's hear that. The only way to resolve some of the affordability crisis is to diversify the housing options that are available throughout the region. And one major role of the county board is to make sure that we do uh, diversify the housing opportunities throughout the region. All right, and of course, now she's talking about uh, housing and, and homelessness and affordable housing and all, and that is a, a key issue here. Uh, talk about, uh, Maya, you wrote in your story about uh, both candidates addressing that, and they both agree it is a serious issue. Yeah, I mean, I think everyone in San Diego County will agree that affordable housing and homelessness is a huge issue. It's something that we all see every single day. Um, and it's in terms of the county supervisors, one of their biggest roles is providing social services. and homelessness is a huge thing and in the past couple of years the Board of Supervisors really has been starting to gear up on that front with um, Project One for All which has been helping homeless veterans and projects that are tying um, mental illness funding with homelessness and trying to make strides in that and uh, Gaspar as Mayor of Encinitas has also recently started a pilot program to deal with homelessness in that city as well. To what extent does the Andrew? County Board of Supervisors actually uh, have a role in helping build new housing or you know as she was talking about diversifying the housing market I mean isn't most of that decided by the cities and not the county? Yeah, I mean, but there is a lot of um, unincorporated land sure. that is still undeveloped, and yeah. actually most of the cities uh, are pretty built out. And so, I mean, that's one of the big debates right now is, you know, are we going to stick to infill development and building housing where there's already housing and infrastructure, or are we just going to build where there's space? More sprawl. <laughs> yeah, and that's one of the big debates, and uh, that's yeah. what, you know. Well, you can understand, you know, people say, thinking, look at all that wonderful open, open space out there in the back country, and that is the area that the supervisors have authority over, so it, yeah. it's, it's vulnerable. However, Dave Roberts, I think, is making the point that there is a general plan that has places for new development. In well, the that's a nice country. segue, because we have a bite <laughs> from Roberts okay. about that that I want to get to. You know, we've got a general plan here in the county, and I believe that the voters are really concerned about quality of life issues. And they're concerned about congestion. They're concerned about overdevelopment. And they want a supervisor that's going to stand up and say, enough is enough. And that's really what I've been doing, is really making sure that we look at our communities and we don't have rampant overdevelopment. Now, that whole development thing seems to clash with what we just spoke about, which is we need more housing, that is, development of some sort. Yeah. Okay. No, oh, go ahead. Well, go ahead. So the general plan lays out development along places where there's public transit, it's close to major highways, and it's close to where there's already development and infrastructure, and that's where there's housing you know, that's where they plan to build future housing. Um, but some of the problem is that uh, neighbors or it's more costly, you know, and neighbors don't want development in those areas. And so it's not always easy to build there. And that's why some of the people who are just pro-development or who just think that we just need to build more housing, period, would, you know, prefer to 
build sprawl development because you can just get it done and you can build big master plan communities with thousands of homes. And, and sort of the way that California law has been working for the past uh, several decades has really encouraged that. There's, I mean, you don't, when you do an environmental impact report, it essentially encourages more development out in the backcountry because it's, there's no, there's less of an impact on traffic. If you build really dense or ur urban mm -hmm. development, you're assuming all of those uh, extra people living in there are going to be driving cars and you're going to slow down um, the traffic in those areas. So there, I mean, there's, there's sort of a, a, a shift in California as a whole underway to encourage uh, less sprawling development and, and sort of shift our frame of thought in, in how that development affects the environment. All right, we're going to shift now to a first cousin of that, and this is, <laughs> this is your topic, Andrew. So vexing might be a good word to describe Measure A on the November, November ballot. It calls for a half cent increase in sales taxes countywide to be spent on transit, freeways, and infrastructure. So Andrew, how much money would it raise and how is it going to be spent? And this is over a long period of time. Yeah, so the tax would last 40 years. It's expected to raise about $18 billion over that time. And uh, the largest share of the money would go to public transit. About 42% of the money would go to that. Um, both capital improvement projects, including new bus rapid transit lines, a new trolley line, uh, and also continuing transit operations. Uh, the next biggest share would go to local infrastructure. 25% uh, of the money would go there. And that would basically just give cash uh, grants to cities to use pretty much however they want. They can use that for local infrastructure, um, uh, road repair, bridges, you know, all, all different kinds of things, including transit. Um, and then the third share goes to, third largest share goes to highways, um, mostly uh, HOV and managed lanes, but a few general purpose lanes that are particularly controversial, which we can get into later. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then there's some money for open space preservation as well. All right, now, as we said, uh, this has got people on all sides of the fence and is very divisive. Let's start with uh, Councilman, San Diego Councilman Todd Gloria. He's an advocate of Measure A, talking about how this whole thing came together as a compromise. That is Republicans who are supporting tax increases, even when it's politically not something they're supposed to do. Um, or Democrats who are willing to say, you know what, we will agree to finance some freeway expansion in order to get a massive increase in public transit for our community. All right, and so who else is backing uh, Measure A besides that prominent name? Well, there is a funded campaign, a Yes on A campaign, and that's mostly funded by uh, the people who would benefit from all of this tax money. So uh, carpenters, laborers, some of the businesses that, that want to see this these, these tax dollars Construction spent. folks. Construction yeah. folks, yeah. Um, it's also been endorsed by the uh, County Taxpayers Association, the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, interestingly enough, a, a pro-transit organization, Circulate San Diego, they saw it as basically the best that we can get at this time. Tax measures are very difficult to pass in California. You need a two-thirds majority and, uh, you know, you have to sort of look at the political realities and see, okay, how many people are riding transit and how many people actually want to tax themselves in order to give more money to it. All right. All right. Let's, uh, let's give the other side here another prominent uh, San Diego leader, uh, another Democrat, as Todd Gloria, uh, David Alvarez, Councilman in San Diego, here's what he says. There is money for transit in this measure for sure, but it really isn't how much money is there. What, what, this, what this measure actually does is it increases freeway capacity in some of the most burdened communities already in, uh, in the South Bay in San Diego, uh, but also in other areas in the North County where we get more cars, which means more pollution. All right, so he's talking specifically, Allison, go ahead, about well, the, his, I mean, his area. I, yeah. I take his point, and it seems like um, there is a minority of the, the funding that's going towards freeway construction, but uh, there are people who feel like even that is too much, and you talked about the political realities. My question is if we've got billions that would go to public transit, which is essential if we are going to increase density in the urban areas, then how long is it going to take for the political reality to change, whereby they could get something like this through without all the freeway Well, that's the big question. I think there's a lot of discussion about, okay, well, if all these environmental groups oppose Measure A, uh, what's their plan B? What, what are they going to do uh, to, to actually um, build out the transit network that, um, that they admit is very necessary? Um, you know, I, David Alvarez told me in an interview he's interested in exploring uh, a tax through MTS, the um, transit operator. They don't actually plan or fund transit themselves, but they may or may not have the legal authority to actually impose a, a tax on those communities that, that MTS covers, which is really just um, the city of San Diego and the South, uh, South County communities. Um, you know, the, these tax measures basically need two things. They need a presidential election to happen because that's when the most number of, of sort of tax-friendly progressives actually turn out and vote. 
and they need a good economy. And uh, you know, four years from now, the next presidential election, we very well may be in a recession. So uh, you know, I haven't yet heard a very um, serious and politically viable alternative to uh, what Measure A on the ballot. Well, it needs a two-thirds majority, right? And, and as we saw in 07, the terrible wildfires we had here, something like 1,900 homes destroyed, and, and it fell short. Uh, that is a, a, a measure for firefighting equipment, improved uh, communications, et cetera. It didn't quite get there. What are the chances of this one uh, passing? Now? The, the last polling that I've seen, public polling, is, was done by SANDAG, the San Diego Association of Governments, which crafted this measure. And they, are, uh, they saw it as basically within the margin of error, right around uh, two-thirds majority. Uh, the polling company also told them that if there's a funded opposition campaign, then that could really sink this measure. And there is. It's, basically, it's being bankrolled by a union that wanted uh, certain concessions to union labor here. So, um, you know, the chances of passing at this point seem fairly slim. That's tough. All right. Well, since we're talking mostly about San Diego County, we're going to check back in one final time on the controversial Measure B, an initiative on a development known as Lilac Hills. Uh, Allison, remind us again, uh, where is it, what is it, the uh, scope of it and all. Okay, so Lilac Hills is up uh, Interstate 15 there, north of Escondido. So, uh, you know, for many people, that's like way up there in the, in the hinterlands. Um, the plan would build 1,700 homes and some retail uh, in an area that the general plan called for only 110 homes. So it's not just a minor adjustment or amendment. This is like a major shift of um, a mini city about the size of Del Mar plonked in the middle of some semi uh, rural agricultural kind of area. And that's not the plan up there, right? Uh, they, they worked long and hard on, a, on an area well, plan I think, there. I think, I think this is one thing that all voters need to think about. And of course, when you have a countywide vote, I mean, everybody's going to vote on this from Chula Vista up to North County. Yeah, you're miles and miles away yeah. and may not ever heard of this It's easy to area. think, well, you know, the, why don't we put it up there? And, yeah. you know, you've got Mary Salas from uh, Chula Vista who's in favor Way of it. Way down in the south. But um, the thing to think about it really is, you know, if it happened to your community, because if you had a general plan, a plan, a neighborhood plan, that you'd spent possibly years, in this case they did spend years on this plan, and then the developer decided that they weren't getting the okay from your local jurisdiction and threw it on the ballot for everyone to vote on, it could happen to you just as well as it could happen to the people in Valley Center. So it's worth thinking about the process as well as the need for more housing. Mm -hmm. And I think in addition to just this kind of troubling pattern of developers going to the ballot, um, that project is the first of many that are in line looking for permission to build out there. And this is a place that the county has not planned to build in previously. And so in voting on this measure, voters are really deciding on how they see the future of our county and where we want housing to be built and where we want people to live in the future. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, you opponents complain that this is a, quote, leapfrog development. What, what do they mean by that? Well, it's pretty easy to visualize. You know, you're leapfrogging a, a, a community the size of Del Mar into the middle of a rural area. So the roads don't really support it. Uh, it does seem to be close to 15, but actually there's quite a, a stretch of very narrow two-lane road between it and the freeway. And there is a road into Valley Center, which is wide and broad that we have spent as taxpayers a lot of money to build up into Valley Center, but that's seven miles to the east. And that's where the general plan is calling for growth. So in this particular area, it would be leapfrogging into an area where the infrastructure does not currently support it, resulting in some major expenses mm -hmm. for taxpayers so if it was approved. Now, a question from the developer's perspective. If they see, you know, one would assume they're not pursuing this project unless they, they believe that they can actually make money on it. But if yeah. this community is going to be, you know, plagued by traffic, then wouldn't that basically just uh, decrease the value of these homes if, if, if the infrastructure around it doesn't actually support the development? There's such a low vacancy rate in the county that I think that all homes everywhere, if they're open, mm. traffic isn't as big of an issue for a lot of people, a lot of middle income people. And I think that this community, are, they are saying that they're going to provide homes that are like $400,000, which is pretty affordable in San Diego County. Um, so that is kind of, I think that the market is such that traffic and distance might not matter so much once they're built. And the fact of the matter awesome. is that uh, they probably bought the land fairly cheaply because it wasn't zoned for development. So they're likely to be able to make a profit, although after all the extra spending on this initiative, I, I mean, I just don't know how they're going to make a profit without actually raising the price of those houses beyond what they're currently saying. Now, as, as we touched on earlier, um, can you really expect voters way away from this, miles away from this, to really know much or care, especially when we've got this you know, phone book ballot here that we're mm. all getting in the mail now, the sample? This week. I think that's what the developer is counting on, is that the voters all over the county is, is you know, just 
going to take a look and say, oh, we need more housing. And then there have been these promises that it would be affordable housing. There's no guarantee of that. And in fact, you know, once it actually gets built, it's likely they'll all be over half a million dollars. So. Yeah, we drove Sir. past some no or yes yeah. on B uh, signs on the way here, and they only really just say housing. And so I think that's a little intentionally um, misleading. Uh, you know, it's not going to provide housing for people in City Heights, which is where all the signs are. Um, but if all you see is housing, you think, yeah, of course we need that. Right. And the thing is, this is awesome. one of the, like you were saying, Mara, it, it, it's one of the first in the pipeline. So people might think, oh, finally a big, you know, 1,700 homes, that might help. But whether this passes or not, there are some other projects in the pipeline and there are some other projects that conform to the general plan that are actually about to be built. So I think, you know, there will be more housing up in that area. A couple of seconds Evans. left. Any idea on is it going to pass? Has there been a poll uh, support? I, 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 I wouldn't like to gamble on this one, uh -huh. actually, yeah. yeah we just I mean, we, we've seen the developers spending about yeah. a million on it, and uh, the opposition is much less. But I don't know if money's the key issue we'll or not. We'll find out in three weeks. Well, that does wrap up another week of stories at the KPBS Roundtable. I'd like to thank my guest, Sarah Libby, a voice of San Diego, Maya Shri Krishnan, also a voice of San Diego, Andrew Bowen of KPBS News, and Allison St. John, also of KPBS News. A reminder, all the stories we discussed today are available on our website, kpbs.org. I'm Mark Sauer. Thanks for joining us today on The Roundtable.